Chapter 44, Friendship. The Christian church was the first time and strange experience for me. In a lot of ways, it was the opposite of the mosque that Muslims attend. I found it odd that the Christian women of the church could not cover up themselves for at least one day, their day of worship. Instead, they arrived decked out in tight, short clothing. Mothers and daughters alike had their necks, cleavage, breasts, thighs, and legs exposed to some degree slight or completely bold and obvious. There was no difference between the 30-year-old women and the 14-year-old girls back on my block. I doubted that any man could concentrate on God in this setting. At the same time, the men were all well-suited, dressed, and completely covered up, escorting their mothers, wives, sisters, and daughters who were half naked. I couldn't figure it out. Everyone in their church entered through the same doors and prayed together, sitting down or standing up and in the same space. In the mosque, the men either prayed in front of the women with the women praying behind them, or the prayer areas were side by side or in separate spaces. We believe that prayer is supposed to be devoted completely to Allah, with no diversions or lusts or preoccupations working their way into the eyesight mind or thoughts of the Muslim. Besides, we start off standing when we pray, but we conclude completely bent over with our heads touching the ground in complete respect and praise of God. Chris's father, the Reverend, who Amir and I have seen over the years, looked different in his church robes. I mean, he was always a conservative and quiet moving man who I never seen rock a pair of jeans, not even once. Outside of his church, when we would see him, he usually wore some style of a hat, hard bottom shoes, dress shirts, dress socks, and slacks, even at sporting events and on weekends. Now he looked much more removed, like an American Supreme Court judge or a black pope. He was raised up on a higher platform than his congregation, speaking in a loud, tired voice that was projected from the microphone, though it really wasn't needed. The sermon, which we Muslims called a khutbah, was a story from their Holy Bible. Luke chapter 15, about a son who makes wrong choices in his life despite his father's advice and teachings. The son runs away to another town to live the way he wants to live outside of the eyesight and reach of his father. The son ends up spending his monies foolishly and is forced to take a job working with pigs. The son finally realizes that he needs his father and should have respected his father's wisdom in the first place. The son returns to the father begging for forgiveness. The father forgives and accepts his son, even though the son really didn't do anything good or right or respectful to show and prove that he deserved his father's forgiveness. After listening to the sermon, I knew that Chris's father knew all about what happened at the party last night. The disappointment was felt in his words and stamped on his tired face. I also knew that Chris would be forgiven. However, the point seemed to be that he would have to do something to win back his father's trust. All me and Amir could see was the back of Chris's head. He was seated in the first row of the church and we were seated in the last row of the church. Amir said, let's just walk up there and go get him. We can't start walking around while the brother's father is speaking. I said, let's just chill to the end. Then we can get at him. Some people who were seated behind the reverend up there and facing the congregation stood up. A funny looking dude started giving them hand signals and they all began to sing. Amir leaned over to me and said, that's a faggot right there, 100%. Faggot, that's an American thing, I thought to myself. Or I should say a European thing. I hear this word used all the time and am still confused by it. I was only sure that we didn't have no faggots back home where I come from. Usually, when cats pointed out a faggot, it was some guy who dressed, walked, or talked and acted like a female. Or some boy who could not do the same things that other boys did eagerly and naturally, like playing sports, fighting, and fixing things. My confusion came in when black American boys called a boy who loves his mother a faggot, or when the Jamaicans called a faggot a mama man, or when somebody said a boy who sticks by his mother helps her out often and protects her is some kind of faggot. To me, there had to be a difference between a boy who acted like or wanted to be a woman and one who loves his mother a whole lot. For me, loving, standing by, serving, and protecting Uma was like breathing, a strength and not a weakness. 
so I just didn't respond to Amir's comment. A paper plane came flying from the right side of the room and landed in the lap of the woman seated beside Amir. Excuse me, that's for me, Amir told the woman. He unfolded the plane and we both read the note at the same time. We see you're new to our church. We think you and your friend are cute. We are sitting on your right side, the third and fourth girl in red dress and long hair and yellow blouse and short hair. Meet us downstairs afterwards. Amir looked at me and smiled. See, I told you these Christian dudes are faggots. Christian girls want Muslim dick. Now I knew based on Amir's words that faggot also meant a male who wasn't fucking all the girls who wanted to get fucked. I thought to myself, this one word had a whole lot of different meanings. It still meant nothing to me as a Sudanese. A well-dressed woman wearing everything brand new sang a sad song. She looked like she had been to hell, seen the devil, and come back. The tears eased out of her eyes as she sang. The people stood for what seemed to be the final prayer. I stood too. They bowed their heads. I faced the front until the prayer was over. Come on, I told Amir. Let's go talk to Chris. Chris was shocked to see us. He touched the material on both of our dress shirts as if he was impressed. Get the fuck out of here. You two in church? He said. Then looked around to see if anyone overheard him. He glanced at his father who was standing at the front receiving people one by one. Who seemed to just want to greet him and touch and shake his hand. Let's step to the back, Chris told us. Is that your mother seated there? I asked him. Oh yeah, let me introduce you, he said. His mother was polite but more focused on her husband and his activity at the front of the church. Chris explained, these are my two best friends from the dojo who I tell you about all the time. We also met Chris's younger sister and brother who were perfectly dressed, well behaved, faces shining with a thick coat of Vaseline. As we three walked towards the back of the church, we were intercepted by a young female wearing pretty pumps on her feet, a tight skirt and silk blouse nipples erect even through her bra. She stuck her foot out as if to trip Chris. He stopped walking. She stood directly in front of him, playfully pushing him and asking, aren't you gonna introduce me to your friends? He introduced her as his girlfriend, a surprise to both of us. Afterwards, she tried to follow us to the back, but Chris told her to go sit down and wait on him. In the back corner of the church, he filled us in about what happened. Last night, I almost got away. I was real close. But the cop who was chasing me tripped and fell and busted his ass. I shouldn't have laughed, but it was funny watching him down on the pavement, grabbing for his hand radio. I started running again, got about 40 feet out of his way. Then a police car shot across my path, slammed on the brakes, cut me off. The next thing I knew, you are under arrest. They cuffed me and pushed me into the back seat. I was just glad they didn't kill me, because they did clap up some other kid, dead over nothing, some bullshit. Another cop car pulled up with three girls riding in the back. The window came down and all three girls were all staring at me. They started speaking among themselves. Then I saw them tell the cop who was driving the police car, no. No what? Amir asked. No, I wasn't one of the ones who snatched their gold chains. There was like six girls and three dudes whose jewels got swiped at the party. The dumbass cops caught all the wrong boys and the real ones got away, Chris said. Were you scared? Amir asked. Hell yeah, I'm not gonna lie. I was hoping y'all would be down there at Central Booking when I arrived. You know three is better than one. They laughed. How did you get out in less than 24 hours? I asked them on a serious note. You must have snitched on them other dudes, Amir said, only half joking. I couldn't snitch on nobody. I never even saw what happened. That shit went down so fast, Chris swore. But Amir and I both knew it was the Red Hook niggas from the Red Team that led the whole caper. Then how did you get out? I repeated my question. He answered reluctantly. My pops called Mayor Koch, got his ass right out of his bed. The mayor made a couple of calls. Next thing I know, I get released. My pops was waiting right there with the caddy. I walked out pretending like I was all cool, but I was so happy I didn't have to close my eyes and sleep with all them niggas on the lockup. I almost peed on myself. We all laughed. Does he really have that kind of clout, your father? I asked. Yeah, he's head of the minister's conference. The mayor always has to come through him to get anything done in the black church or the community. So I guess he just owed my pops one, Chris said easily. 
Anyway, the mayor had to do something. His cops clapped the kid, unjustifiable homicide, excessive force, Chris said. I knew he must have heard those phrases getting thrown around last night. Unbelievable. What a break. For real, I said. Me and Amir was all worried about you for nothing. You was out there getting the royal treatment. Nah, that's cool. I appreciate y'all coming up here. That's all right. I'll always remember how you two looked out, Chris said in a serious tone. Don't think I got over either. My pops is going to announce my punishment tonight. I just hope he don't go crazy and lock me in his jail for the summer. When the three of us came out of our huddle and turned around, there were about six girls waiting on us. Me and Amir didn't know none of them. Chris felt good about this being his territory and said, come on, let me introduce y'all to the church chicks. As we walked over, I saw the Reverend approaching from the distance. I elbowed Chris to bring it to his attention. Young man, the Reverend called to his son. Yes, father, Chris tensed up to attention and responded respectfully. So you have been joined by your friends, he said dryly. Well, good for them. Where were you fellas last night when Chris needed you? He glanced over at the girls gathered and waiting for us. Let's go, gentlemen, step into my chambers. We followed silently. The Reverend pronounced to his secretary, I need some time with my son. Make sure no one disturbs us. My eyes bounced around the walls of his private office. The images were all foreign to me. When you three first met, you were boys. Now you are young men. There is a difference, you know. Boys play, young men handle their business. The Reverend lectured, no laughter or doubt in his style. He was seated upright in his big black leather chair. I was listening, but at the same time, I was still looking at the wall over his head. Plastered there was his picture of Jesus. I thought to myself that there is not one Muslim out of the three billion Muslims in the world who believes he has a picture of God or that God could ever be captured in a photograph or painting. In a mosque, we do not have images or pictures or snapshots or symbols or idols on our walls or anywhere else for that matter. Muslims acknowledge the great works and life of Jesus. However, we don't believe that Jesus is God or the son of God. We believe that Jesus was a prophet, a chosen messenger of God, selected as other prophets were selected by God to carry out and perform incredible and extraordinary works and deeds like Moses even. Boys do things because they want to. Boys respond to impulse. Young men do things because they should. They are in the process of setting up to be responsible, to carry their weight. Are you young men listening? Are you understanding me? I looked at Amir, his arm draped around the chair where he was sitting. He was checking the place out same as I was. I knew when we left here, he would have something sharp to say about all of this. Chris had his head bowed, listening, as though he heard these lessons every day. As you grow older, you have to weigh your decisions. Everything you do means something. Your actions all have a value. When you're doing nothing, you are losing something valuable, either time or money or both. And they are both the same thing. The Reverend was tapping his huge finger on his desktop to emphasize his important words. It's easy for you fellas to lose money because it's not your money directly. It's easy to waste your father's money and your father's time. As a man, it's my job to stop you from wasting money and time, especially my money, my time. Chris is going to be the first to stop. He's not going to be attending the karate class anymore until he can live a responsible life. He's not going to be playing in any basketball league until he can demonstrate that he understands what is important and what it takes to earn real money. Chris is going to focus on hitting the books, getting top marks in school, and working for his father. Only by working with his father will he become careful with his father's money. Amir waited for the Reverend to take a breath and jumped right in. Sir, the party we went to last night only cost $5, and when we play ball, we earn our own money. He was trying to counter the reverend's assumptions. What do you know about money? Do you even have insurance? He asked Amir. Amir smirked. He probably didn't know what the rev was talking about because I sure didn't. When you go to apply for insurance, the insurance agent asks several questions about how you live your life every day. They want to know how big of a fool you are, what type of risk and gambles you take with your own life. It's the only way they can figure out how much risk is involved in doing business with you. 
Now you three went to a party, most likely looking for girls in a neighborhood that is not your own with people who are complete strangers to you. If I was an insurance agent on a scale of one to 10, I would say that you three rank a 10 as far as fools are concerned. The Reverend said with an angry scowl, who cares that you paid the $5 entry fee? He barked on a mirror. I have invested real money in Chris, 5,000 on his braces, 20,000 a year for his private schooling and about 15,000 on his martial arts training to date. I've sunk a lot of money into this one son. And as you know, he has a younger brother and sister. He leaned back now in his big chair. Not only is this church a corporation, his life is a corporation and so is yours, whether you know it or not. I wasn't mad at the Reverend as I listened. I started to enjoy the way he was throwing the numbers around. I liked any talk about business, setting it up and earning money, as long as the person talking could get around to the point. Then the Reverend continued, last night before I received the phone call from the police, I was looking through my tax receipts for this year. Counting them up is a big job. I got a couple of crates filled with receipts that have to be sorted out and added up. Every year, every man in business in America has to submit a record of his expenses. Every purchase a man makes matters, has to be documented and reported. You know why? The Reverend asked. We three sat there in silence. Chris knows why. A real friend doesn't play dumb. Chris, teach these boys what you already know. Share with them what I taught you, he ordered his son. Chris lifted his head and answered, because half of everything a businessman earns in America belongs to the United States government. And every April 15th, that money is due, and every businessman has got to pay it. Chris spoke like an automated recording or telephone operator. Now tell them what happens to businessmen who don't collect receipts, keep proper records, and pay the government half of their earnings, the Reverend told Chris. They pay fines and interest on their debt, and they go to jail, Chris answered. Straight to jail. Do not pass go like the Monopoly game. The only thing is, real life is not a game, the Reverend emphasized. We three spent the rest of Sunday with pencils in our hand and paper at our table, sorting and counting the reverend's receipts without the help of a calculator. Chris told us that all of it was just busy work, just the start of a string of punishments. He said his father had two expensive accountants and had actually already filed his taxes because April 15th had passed more than a week ago, and his dad never misses deadlines. He also said that churches don't pay taxes like other corporations do, but his father has other businesses and personal expenses to account for. There were thousands of receipts. We were just trying to help Chris out, hoping that if we did a good job, his father would respect us enough to let Chris at least continue in the martial arts. We knew the basketball league was out for Chris. His father did not know that there was a big money prize involved in the game. He did not know it was the Hustlers League. If we told him, we would get the same result, no Chris. Shit is fucked up, I thought to myself. I wish the Reverend and some of his crew had sponsored the league. Then the hustlers wouldn't have to. When the church cooks brought plates of food back for each of us to eat, I kept thinking, this church is a corporation. As I looked at the food plate, I saw a separate price tag hanging over each item in my mind. I felt I needed to leave my money on the table for this meal, even for the two glasses of water I drank. The Reverend had convinced me that everything had a price, no matter how small. During our 20-minute food break, I tried to think about what my father would say about the Reverend's words and opinions. My father is a deep thinker and planner, and extremely successful in business. When he spoke the truth, it punctured everyone's fantasy bubble. After a while, my father's words came to me, streaming clear-cut across my mind. My father would say, all men are risk and all men must take risks. There is no insurance or guarantee. Only Allah can give that. Only Allah can take it away. My father would have his head pressed to the ground, thanking Allah for granting my narrow escape.